Yes, well, uh, any of you who have read uh, Genesis 1, uh, when you get to the end of the chapter there, it says, and God saw all that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. But uh, as you know from your own experience, the world is not very good. So obviously something bad has happened and people do wonder, well, why do things seem to be so well designed for a bad world if God made everything very good? So I'm just going to share a couple of examples. Uh, now, the first one is not snakes. Um, it's actually frogs. Now, people like frogs. They're really cute. And here are some lovely looking frogs. Uh, aren't they lovely? I mean, look at that one. <laughs> And uh, that one, even he's a bit more subtle, but even so, he's got uh, a, an interesting pattern there. Um, but uh, these little frogs might look very pretty, but they're actually deadly poisonous, right? These are poison dart frogs. You might have heard of these. They don't live in Australia. Uh, they, uh, they live in, um, in South America, although they've been exported all around the world and they are kept in zoos because people like them because they're so pretty. But uh, there's a very interesting thing about poison frogs. Um, they don't actually make their own poison. It's derived from their diet. They eat millipedes and ants and small invertebrates. And as part of their um, digestive and processing, their chemical biochemistry, um, they uh, break these down <clears throat> and the waste products are actually exported to their skin because frog skin has glands in it and it can be used to um, excrete uh, substances that they don't want. Now think about that yeah, because I have a couple of questions. Would poison dart frogs be poisonous in the very good world? Right? And in fact, the answer to that is no, and I'll explain why in a moment. Okay, question two. What would want to eat poison frogs in the very good world? And that's an important question because the standard evolutionary story about these is that they develop these bright colours as a warning system to animals that might want to eat them by saying, you go away, I'm poisonous, so don't eat me. And uh, particularly that red one, it's meant to be a sort of red flag um, that these are poisonous. But in fact, in the very good world, nothing would want to eat them. Now, why can we say that? All right, if we go back to Genesis, we're very <clears throat> clearly told to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heaven and to everything that creeps on the earth. So frogs are somewhere in there. They're um, land-dwelling animals. They creep on the earth. Everything that has the breath of life, they're air breathing. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So in the good world, frogs didn't eat millipedes or ants or other creepy crawlies and other animals didn't eat frogs so that wouldn't have been a problem the world would have been very good but there are some animals that do seem to be designed so well for killing so I'm sorry about um, if, if you don't look like snakes I've got a couple of pictures of snakes coming up so uh, <clears throat> uh, listen rather than look all right now snakes have sharp teeth to bite, they have venom to poison things, and some snakes even have heat sensors, and the standard story for those is that they were designed to, um, to find warm-blooded prey because some of these snakes eat sort of mice and small mammals which are warm-blooded or small birds. So let's have a look at that. Now up at Jurassic Ark, uh, in Australia, we have these creatures. This is a red-bellied black snake. Um, I did actually see one up there when I was there a few years ago. It was dead. There's no way I would have gone near it if it had been alive. <laughs> um, but they are there, and we do have to warn people about them, uh, as well as other things like spiders and um, uh, other things. Now, let's think about how snakes eat their food. They don't chew their food. So having sharp teeth is quite useful for piercing their food, whatever it is. 
And the interesting thing about venom is that even the evolutionists will admit that it is uh, related, the venom, the chemicals in venom are related to the chemicals in digestive systems, right? Digestive enzymes and various other chemicals that aid that. So the venom actually starts chemical digestion. So if you think about this, this is quite good design, irrespective of what the snake is going to eat. They have sharp teeth, they will pierce the food inject the venom, right, and then swallow it whole. And the digestive process has started from inside as well as starting from outside when the uh, food gets into their stomach. So that seems like a good piece of design. They'd <clears throat> it's not necessarily designed to kill things, even though it does in this world today. Right. Now, what about the uh, heat sensing device okay it's called a pit and the snakes that have this are called pit vipers and it is useful for sensing warm-blooded prey but was that always its function what was it designed for now in the recent literature um, there's been some interesting studies on this and it's a good example of how evolution is not a good world view for understanding what we see in the world today. But creation is. And I just want to um, uh, encourage students who are going into study biology, having a biblical view of the worldview will actually help you understand biology. It won't, um, it won't hinder you. So here's an example. All right. Now, here is uh, one of these uh, pit vipers, and the heat-sensing pit looks like a little nostril. It's not a nostril. It's actually a, a little indentation, and there are heat-sensitive, um, you know, infrared-sensitive uh, nerves at the base of that. Now, a couple of years ago, this article was published in the Journal of Experimental Biology, which is a fairly high-profile, prestigious journal, and I don't know why, if you can see the uh, the title of that, I deliberately used this screenshot just to make to show you that I'm not making it up. But here is the title, uh, a little bit easier to read. Cooler snakes respond more strongly to infrared stimuli, but we have no idea why. Now, I've got to really admire the honesty of these scientists. They have done a series of experiments and they can't explain their results. And they were honest enough to, to say that right up front, even, even in their title. Okay. So what they did is, or what their thinking was, right, snakes are cold-blooded. Um, now, technically, that doesn't mean they, they sort of refrigerate a cold all the time. They do actually get quite warm but they get their heat from outside. A uh, technical term is ectothermic, right, from, from outside. They are less active when their body temperature falls. They get quite sluggish. When, they are, um, <clears throat> when their body temperature rises, they are more active. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, this is what they found in uh, the experiments they did that uh, that article is based on. Now, they did it with rattlesnakes. Now, you know, fearsomely venomous, poisonous snakes. And they said, remarkably, rattlesnakes sensing warm moving targets with their facial pits, that's those little pits um, that we, we looked at in the, the picture a few slides away, are less responsive as body temperature increases. Okay. So these scientists were genuinely confused. We review various physiological mechanisms, in other words, body function mechanisms related to body temperature in the proposed literature, but none can satisfactorily explain the results. In other words, we, we found this odd thing, but we can't explain it. But they were honest enough to publish their results. All right. The interesting thing is they could have found the answer to their question in the very journal that uh, they published these results, if they had gone back to 2004. I don't know whether they did that. I'm not criticising them for that. But, uh, but anyway, this is another article in the same journal and it's called Heat in Evolution's Kitchen. Now notice the, the evolutionary mindset here. Evolutionary perspectives on the function and origin 
of the facial pits of pit vipers, okay, and that's their, uh, their scientific name. In other words, this was um, studying these pits to see can we explain where they came from and what they, what they originally came into being for. Now, they just assume that if it exists, it must have evolved, so they have to throw that word at everything. <laughs> And the, uh, the new service that comes out from the journal named Science wrote a lovely little summary of this that I couldn't say better myself. And we published this in our fact file where we archive a lot of our science news. All right. Biologists have long thought that pit vipers use the heat sensing pits in their faces to track warm blooded prey. But in a paper in the 15th of November, the Journal of Experimental Biology, they found that pits also help the snake gauge the temperature of their surroundings. Knowing when to slither underground to beat the heat is a key survival skill for cold-blooded creatures. And the researchers say that thermoregulation, in other words, temperature regulation, not hunting, may be why the pits evolved. Now, again, they've got the evolutionary mindset. If it exists, it must have evolved. <laughs> so let's uh, give a few clues to our clueless scientists. The pits were actually designed for thermoregulation in the very good world, in other words, for temperature regulation, because that is a useful function. And in the very good world, snakes would have used the outside temperature to uh, regulate their own temperature. When they got too warm, they would need to uh, go and find some shade or go underground. When they were cold, they would seek out some heat. Now, that is still a useful function, and the snakes do use it in this fallen world that we live in, the world that's no longer good, right? Now, as it happens, it's also useful for finding prey, but that is something that came later. So I would encourage you to have a biblical mindset or a creation mindset when you look at biology. You will see created design, you see brilliant design. So think about creation first, but things didn't stay that way. They went downhill. So think, don't think evolution, right, upwards increasing complex complexity. Think of creation followed by degeneration or as we like to say at creation research, the world has gone from good to bad to worse. And we see that in the world that we study around us. So don't be afraid to take uh, up science and study the world around you with a biblical worldview. In fact, it will explain things that the evolutionary scientists can't. And it will also help you to understand um, the nature of our, our God and Father who created us and who is also our judge and our saviour.